Okay, I'm here for another episode of Reflections. This one is with JW, who is actually a return guest. He was on a previous episode of Reflections right at the end of 2014. And that's an interesting place for us to pick up our conversation from JW, because if you remember, that was where Fnatic had become the best team in the world. You were winning all those tournaments. You won three tournaments in a row. And then you came into the major and you had the game against the infamous LDLC game now, which ended with the overpass boost. And so obviously at that point in time, you didn't win the major. And people, here's the funny thing. When people look back in history, they all, I've noticed fans tend to look back and when they see results, they think as though like, oh, that always had to happen. You know, like that result would always have gone that way. The team who won this was always going to win that match. So what's funny is people will think now, well, of course, Fnatic was going to win majors eventually. And they were always going to be one of the greatest teams ever. But I remember back then some player, some teams and players even being like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe Fnatic's really, really good in the medium tournaments. But, you know, maybe they like, maybe they weren't as good at the major. Because if you remember, actually, LDLC was doing pretty well in that match. Yeah. And obviously, LDLC won the major. When you lost that major... Did, were you ever worried, like maybe maybe I'm not I'm not going to win a major, maybe may, maybe this this lineup's not going to be the best anymore? Was there ever any concern? I don't think we ever thought thought about that. Like the the whole uh, boost thing got like so much attention and like all that, so that was the only thing in our heads. Pretty much, we didn't really think even about the future at that point. Like most of us were pretty ready to quit <laughs> pretty much but uh ended up not doing that and i mean luckily for us i guess so that's something i wanted to talk about people forget this jw but the greatest team in csgo history might have just ended right there might have had to have half a lineup some people just straight retire and we never know what happens to them was it really the case that, like, from what I heard, it was more than one person, like, like two people or something in the team really were thinking, like, that's it. I mean, I think at the time in our interview, you even said something like, it was not, wasn't you, you weren't ever thinking about quitting, but some people were like, you know, maybe we should just quit, like, <coughs> hates too much. I mean, yeah. I remember Gevelwalk did that crazy tweet, which has to be one of the most hysterical tweets ever, where he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I pray to God, you know what you have done. Like, yeah, come on, what happened? It was, like, let's say it was more, more than half of the, or... Yeah, more than half of the team, I guess, uh, that wanted to to quit. And uh, uh, yeah, I was mean, it was it just like a heat of the moment thing? Were they just initially were, or did they really? Was it really like a week or two, and they were like, I don't know if I'm going to play. I kind of think about this. Uh, I think it's like both yes and no because we 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 were actually supposed to uh, like I think it was one or one or two weeks max after we had this uh, ECA land, you know, in uh, North America, and. Uh, we weren't supposed to go there. Uh, we basically, we basically pulled out, and uh, yeah, because things were as they were. People didn't want to play and stuff like that. And but eventually, Patrick Karn, uh, he talked about it and blah blah. And we all understood like, yeah, okay, let's let's uh, do this last tournament. Then we're gonna break and we'll, we'll see what happens. So I think it was very, very important that we actually went to that that tournament and actually won it because, uh, I mean, if we have lost it, maybe it would have affected us more. And I don't know. Uh, but uh, even if we didn't even go there, uh, I don't know if we would be the team today. Uh, so that's both yes and no on your question, I guess. But but just to reiterate, you weren't one of the players really considering quit, right? You would just kept playing and try to make a new team or join another team. Or <clears throat> I mean, I was like, con I was kind of considering because it was like such a low low point. I mean, I have had m much hate uh, through through the whole career, pretty much in CS:GO. And but this this thing was just like it was so much at the same time, and uh, it, it was very very hard for. For me as well as the others, I think, I think me Pronax, not really Pronax, but me Pro Pronax was very very calm though. But me Flasher, for example, I mean we were we were used to it because of the Bukers thing, you know, like. Okay. So we were pretty used to it, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it was like too much for me at that point. But ended up, yeah, we we all sticked together. Uh, but I understand it was way, way, way worse for Crims and Olaf that haven't. They were like coming in and being uh, new, new 
to the top scene kind of you know and yeah. like being praised by everyone and then suddenly on one one game they are hated by the majority you know so i think it was hardest for them uh, but uh, that makes it pretty obvious that it was us three that i mean m- mostly all of and crims wanted to consider to quit i guess and i mean i was pretty in between i guess was it did it make it at that period in time again this is a period of time people have forgotten about it wasn't just the boost it was like if you remember it was coming into dreamhack there was all the shit about flasher and everyone yeah, kept yeah. going on about that and then it's like the the, the it was almost like <clears throat> that like set all the gunpowder around and then the the boost just blew it all up completely so yeah, i remember pretty much like it wasn't even just fans if people remember there was tons of pros saying stuff about the flash eclipse. And then if you remember, during the point where it hadn't been resolved as to whether you would forfeit, whether you would replay the game, there's tons of pros weighing in. You know? Like, I remember one thing people forget is Exist was ma- like, made some sort of tweet like, wow, doesn't everyone feel really sorry for LDLC right now? LDLC was going crazy on Twitter. Like, they, they were winning the, the PR war, you know? You guys were yeah, really yeah. bad that. Was it worse that loads of pros basically took their side on all these issues? I mean, it didn't seem like any pros almost stood up for you guys. No, I think it was... Yeah, as you say, pretty much uh, mo- most of the pros were against us. Uh, the only people I know that uh, actually talked to us and said good stuff to us, that was the Virtus Pro players, like Taz and them. They came to us and like, uh, yeah, told us to just stay strong, you know, and uh, kind words like that. So, I mean, I was very, very, what's the word, like... Uh, uh, surprised by the, for example, Pita, how he can even go out and say something like that, yeah. and then uh, it's okay. He turned out to be a great guy anyway. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, <laughs> but then also like uh, I remember at the hotel, uh, I don't think anyone knows about that though. But we were eating bre- breakfast at the event. Uh, it's just the Cloud Nine story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I think like, it was the SEA, right? No, no, this was uh, DreamHack. Before we went, there, before we even played our first game ah, of the tournament, okay. I think, and okay, then like, yeah, yeah I think like something <coughs> or something. Went. I think it was Sean Gaz, wasn't it? Well, like the whole team, pretty much, like we're sitting and whispering about us and stuff like that, and then like I think uh, Flasha were, uh, yeah, getting breakfast and something at the same time as Samfis, and Samfis just told him like, "You fucking cheating faggot" or something like, so, so, something uh, in <laughs> okay. those words, you know. And uh, I mean. I, it, it was at that point we got the most surprised, I think, like by the by the behavior of the actually pros. And uh, but I mean, I don't know. It's it's really a tough situation to handle, and I don't really know how how to handle a situation like that perfectly, to be honest. So in your career, you mentioned already, like you obviously had this whole problem from the DreamHack book arrest scenario, which I think was that was a long time ago. That was like I think that was like September, October of 2013. Yeah. And the whole not shaking hands thing, which has been gone over way too many times. But it was more than that. I mean, per- people thought you cheated in the beginning of CSGO <laughs> because of the game against yeah, yeah. Virtus. Well, they weren't Virtus Pro at the time, but that team. So what I want to know is, how have you had handled this throughout your whole career? Because it seems like in general, you, you, somehow you do handle it. Like, it doesn't ever... Like, I've never seen you get really tilted and do, like, some crazy tweets. Like, well, fuck all... You know, like, look at all the... Th- I mean, speaking of Devil Walk again, yeah, yeah. Look at, if you read in real life, he's a really chill guy, but on, he seems to just go ham on Twitter. Like when Winter Fox went out that tournament, he's like, fuck all you guys, I'll prove you're wrong. I've never seen you go crazy like that. How do you handle it? Are you okay I mean, with being hated to some degree? I mean, it was very hard at first, but I mean, eventually, sadly, these days I'm, I have got used to bullying, if that makes sense. Like, okay. I mean, of course, in the in the beginning, it uh, like affected me a lot, and I mean, almost got not really hurt about about it. But you know, of course, it affected me. But I know, like now, I'm just I'm just used to it. Sadly, I guess. But I think it's also like important that professionals stay professional. You know, like we are. There's many many people that want to become like us, and it's important that we have. A good be, being good role models, I guess. Is it different because you've also won a lot? I mean, I've always thought in the in terms of all the other pros talking shit on you and stuff, that probably wasn't a, it probably. I noticed that went away once you guys just kept winning everything. Eventually, like people just had to shut up and stuff. Like that. D- does that help? I mean, of course it helps. Yeah. the The main thing is always to win. Uh, of course, you want to be liked and all that, but I mean, the main goal will always be to win and. 
that that's the, always the main goal and hopefully people like what you do because you win but sometimes they don't the boost for example but <laughs> yeah have you the, ever the regretted goal. forfeiting uh, actually not because i think it was the right thing to do like since since the boost was so good we did never really try it out on practice games because we didn't risk anyone seeing it so we 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 just saved it for 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 a needed moment <laughs> and uh, yeah after seeing it i mean in my opinion it was too good and it was too overpowered and yeah but but uh, what people seem to forget is that all pr pretty much all the other teams including LLC is that they actually had uh, a similar boost Yes, that our were better and uh, maybe more OP or more broken. I know I don't know how to uh, like uh, explain about that, but in the end, both teams or most teams in that tournament used used uh, boosts that weren't allowed. But it's just that our boost was was simply the best and the most OP. Uh, so that that's why it was actually supposed to be replayed, but. Yeah, after we after we saw uh, the boost and all that, it was pretty obvious for for us that it it wasn't a, a worthy victory, and we would most likely not have won without it. So, sure. So, so okay, one you mentioned the ESEA tournament, right? At the ESEA tournament, a match that actually not that many people seem to remember is when you guys played Titan, and they had Irek, the manager, standing in. That was one of those series where people always talk about, you know, that everyone always brings up the Kenny S iOS Pantamera game, the one where you had the 50 frags on Inferno and they lost. I feel like this is the other one people don't mention enough, <clears> is that <throat> series, because that was the one where they almost beat you guys. It was like like overtime on the third map or 16-14 or something, and he went absolutely ham. He had like almost 90 frags over three maps or something. Right? That was that span of time almost was when Kenny S was like at his peak, you know, like end of basically, unfortunately, after Kaylee got banned, it's kind of when he went it crazy. And then it was right just before the major, the kind of Vitae major, when he kind of dropped off. So, in that span of time, obviously, their best results came against Fnatic. So, I want to ask you, what, how would you describe Kenny S when he was at his peak? Because obviously, he had a slump after that. Maybe some newer fans didn't see him back then. You got to play against what was he actually like in that period of time? I mean, of course, he, he was like the best uh, player individually i guess so but the thing the thing was that including myself and probably many many others as well was that you started to you started to fear him you know because you started to think that he is godlike or whatever like you can't kill him like i think that that's that was something that he took advantage of very very much uh, at that time uh, and i think that is the biggest difference to now uh, people don't really Sure, he have been in a slump and all that, but the most uh, most important factor right now, I would say, is that people don't fear him the same way they did back then. I think. Uh, so I mean, playing against him at that time was always difficult because he he always picked apart your team, wherever wherever he went, and you you had no almost no answers for it. And I don't know if I remember correct, but didn't we lose to them in the upper bracket? And then beat them in lower? Or was no, that no, that was the other one? ESEA. That was oh, ESEA okay. 18, the one that was in April. Before oh, yeah, okay. PGL. Yeah, that was a different one. Okay, well, here's a, here's a quick question as a follow-up to that then. Was there like a noticeable difference when you went into the slump period? Because, I mean, I, I know it was noticed before when Kenny S was really good in 2014. That was one of the things I noticed about your game. Like, that's one of the players where if he was really rolling, you'd be like, ah, oh, maybe I'll trifle this game. Like, just play, just play a bit safer because obviously just taking crazy peaks if he's holding an angle when he was in God mode was, was kind of like a bad move, obviously. Was it more noticeable when he was in the slump? I don't think so, actually. I think it was like everything happened... Uh... Uh, during a span of time, you know, like he maybe he started to fall off at the same time as people stopped fear him. So I don't think it got noticed in the same way uh, like it maybe should have been. I think when we look at all the good opers, people used to say, okay, so it was only Kenny S that got hit by the opener if you remember people used to say it because obviously Skadoodle was really good and then Guardian was even better in the summer and then initially you were still pretty good and everyone's like right no problems D do you think the opener f affected you at all 
I think, uh, yeah, I think, I, I mean, of course it did to some degree, I think, uh, but I don't think I was the most uh, affected by it. Uh, I don't know, it's it's really, really hard to say because it's so long time ago, I barely remember how, how I used to play the off back then, but I, I remember I got sort of uh, nerfed, or how you say, by it, but I think the, the biggest... Uh, uh, like nerfish i got was uh, the c set which which i agree was o op it should have been nerfed and all that but i think the c set uh, hit me more than the op nerf i think okay so the at the beginning of 2015 you played a series the semi-final at the x games which I mean, obviously, because you lost the game probably isn't the most fond memory. But when I watched the game, I was like, this is probably the best series I've seen in CSGO. It was so back and forwards. The one you had with NIP, oh, yeah, you still had Makalele. When you were actually playing in it, can you look back now and was it, was it a great series? Yeah, I think it was. I think we even said that it's like directly after the game. Like, sure, it sucks that we lost, but... It must have been one hell of a game for the viewers, you know. I think we even said that to each other. And I haven't really watched it uh, by myself. But, I mean, thinking back on the game, I'm pretty sure it was a very, very sick game. Because if I remember correctly, it was like very, very back and forth. It was like they won one round, we won one round. And it was never really one team dominating. Yeah, it was always like sick close situations and the trading rounds. So, I think that was one of the best games for sure. So at that tournament, LDLC won that tournament as well, and they'd won the major, and then they won this tournament. And so, I mean, it was understandable that some people could be like, "Oh, you know what? Maybe LDLC will be the best team now. Maybe Fnatic will be like really good, but maybe their time had dropped off." And if you remember, unfortunately, at MLG, that was where Flasher had a pretty bad tournament. And so, with all the ch hype around he was cheating last year, a lot of people probably hoped Fnatic couldn't be that good actually in 2015 because a lot of people thought like, "Oh, they were just cheating anyway," or whatever the fuck people's logic was. Did you? Ha I know if we look at history now, Envious. LDLC never really were like the number one team until actually like late on this year when they got the brand new lineup. In fact, they never beat you guys in a best of X series until I think it was Gfinity Champions of Champions. Did you ever think LDLC was going to be the better team? Could they have been the best team of this era? I think uh, it's like I, I, I've said it in like most interviews against them uh, these days and I think it was pretty much the same before. The thing with them was that they could never ever impress us or uh, do something. They they could never impress us or surprise us uh, with the s tactics. You know, it was only about shooting headshots against them, and we always, maybe not always, shoot more headshots than them. But I think we had the advantage when it comes to strats against them. Uh, so I think like. I think it goes the same back then as it is now. Like they, they could never impress us or surprise us tactically. So I think if they would have more tactically uh, play style ish or more tactics, I think they, they could have been the team of the era or, or whatnot. But I think that was their biggest, uh, maybe their biggest strength, but also their biggest uh, like downside or what you say. What do you think of that style of play then? Because here's the thing. I, I'm Obviously, people know I've been quite critical of their style of play just because I like, re I like really good tactics. And yeah. I like teams that read the game. But I've always given them credit. They won a fucking lot of tournaments over the year and they had a lot of top four finishes. So I can't deny it was very effective to some degree. What do you, what do you think of the style of play overall? Because obviously, if we're being real... Yeah, they had. It's not they had no tactics. They just had simple tactics, and sometimes they just did the same thing over and over and over. And it's just that they had some sick people who shot headshots. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think it's a good playstyle, mostly because because of the game. And I think, like for example, uh, now Valve uh, changed the round time, but what what I think they should have done instead is to reduce the and the smoke time instead because I, I don't really understand why why we should play with like two minutes round time or whatever it is now and 40 minutes 40 seconds bomb time when they could just uh, lower the smoke time and everything would have been fixed in my opinion 
Or what would have been better if the smoke time was shorter? What do you think it would improve? I think it wouldn't be because the thing is now they think the game is like too. I think they think it's like too fast paced or something. I don't, okay. I don't really understand understand the whole thing about that, but I I've think you never watched I, Navi play. No, uh, they they're gonna benefit a lot, I think, because they're not gonna run out of time, hopefully. But I think they they should just lower the the, the smoke timer, and people would need to like speed it up and do like more. I I think it would have made more strategic because now it's like you throw a smoke and you you can wait a lot, but then then if they lower the smoke time, you need to throw the smoke and actually do your shit faster, you know, and. I think that would be lead to a bit more strategic strategical play, but it could also be to the to the other side, I guess, and people would play more more envy, fanatic, stylish. But I think I think I like the style because it's it's the most uh, beneficial style in Cisco, I would say, because that that is how the game currently is. When you won ESL won Kedavice, so with this new lineup, you'd actually won a major. Obviously, you got, I mean, you and Flasher and Products had won the one with the old team, but that was kind of different circumstances because that was where you were the underdogs and you came up and yeah. you won. This time, you were playing NIP again, but this time you were the favorites and you were the ones who were supposed to win and you did win and you won the big major. What is there? A, I, obviously, at the time you win the major, it's like, oh, great, wow, we've won the biggest tournament. So, is it actually different, do you think, to win a major than just win other tournaments? You've won so many majors and tournaments. Is there some significant difference that you can you can point out? I mean, the majors will always be the majors. I don't really know how to, to explain it, but it's like even if a tournament have 250k, uh, like a regular tournament, no no team's probably going to boot camp and stuff for it, but... For for majors, people are actually gonna boot camp and put put in a lot of time. So you know that at every major, the competition is like at the peak level. Everyone is super prepared, and uh, I don't know. I, I I just think that it's mostly the hype build up around the major that makes it such uh, such more Im- nice feeling to win. You know, like I don't know, but yeah, winning the majors is like the best feelings uh, ever currently. I would say. When you, since in that tournament, one of the people who weren't expected to make the final was uh, NIP. Obviously, they almost lost to TSM. Then actually, most people, when they saw the map draw, thought, oh, well, Envy should win this game, you know, and meet you guys in the final. Didn't happen. And then NIP got there, and it was a really close final, actually, in the end. Is there something different for you and your team about playing NIP? Like, for, like for example, even though it's not 2013, it's not 2012, if you play against Get Right and Forest, is there something? Is there still like some sort of factor there where you unduly give them extra respect or something? It seems like they always have done pretty decently against Fnatic, right? Even if sometimes they were slumping elsewhere. The thing is, <coughs> like, first, first of all, we both are Swedish teams, so it feels like Swedish players kind of play the same, and they 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 know a lot about each other. But also, I think like it used to be that uh, you, I, like me, for example, and my team uh, also, we we always loved to play NIP before because you could always play without pressure against them. It was always them having the pressure on them because you know they had this uh, 87 streak and blah blah and all all that you know. So they had always the the pressure on them. So, but I think after a while. Uh, lately, obviously, uh, I think it turned into like we switched roles, kind of. Uh, they they played against us like we had everything to lose, and they have nothing to lose instead. So I think that that's why it's always so close games against them. And also, I think like n- not in that game, but lately, for example, w- when we played close, it's like they have been super hard to play against lately because they just just rush it's like yeah they're super hard to play uh, i don't think if it's only against us but they they're very hard to play against when you won that major if you remember that was the first tournament where everyone was like oh right this olaf meister guy might just be the best player like people who hadn't watched 2014 so you have to remember there's always fans who've only been around six months or a year 
for people who didn't watch the 2014 Fnatic, like 2014 Fnatic, when he started winning all those tournaments, was like that was when Crims was going crazy, and then that was when you were having all those like, great, great games. Obviously, the CZ was like OP as fuck, he was wrecking everyone with the CZ and AWP. Olaf Meister wasn't like some all world player who everyone was like, oh my God, look at him every single game. He was like just a good player who's in your team, he's one of the good players in Fnatic. Did something change in Olaf Meister this year? I think, like, obviously him uh, developing a lot uh, combined with, I think, just uh, just learning his role way, way better. Like, he maybe in the beginning he didn't take as much space as he maybe needed and stuff like that, but not now he, like, he have grown into his role within the team. And uh, so I think he... He have always been capable of uh, being the best player in the world and obviously that's why we picked him up because we believe that but also like i think what's uh, so unique with our team or what was at least in 2014 was like every game it was always one of us being the best player in the world almost like it it, it didn't matter who we played or what tournament it was it was always one in our team that played like the best player in the whole world but this year i think he has he has developed a lot as a player and as a person and just grown into the role in the team and therefore therefore became the best player in the world and have been pretty consistently for almost the whole year i would say so I've noticed in interviews, he always tried to be really humble and be like, no, no, I'm not actually the best player. In fact, you know what? Flush is better than me. He was always trying to be really humble like that. But I always felt like that's like the thing you, if you want to be popular, you probably should say that in interviews. And also it's a very nice gesture to your teammates, you know, for example, to say, oh, you know, Crims wins all the clutch on. So I guess he's the best player, whatever you say, right? But I always felt like behind the scenes, uh, or at least, at the very least, in his own mind, he must really have known he was the best player. Like, he must know. Put it this way, maybe it's like this, okay. So I once asked Kenny S the same thing. I was like, Kenny, like, are you the best player? Like, are you the best opera? And he was like, no, how can I say I'm the best opera? You know, Guardian's very good. But then I just said, like, well, is anyone better than you? And he goes, no. And though, it's like the speed that he said, no, what? It's like, well, yeah, you just, you just really told me what you think. Like, obviously, you do think you're the best. Behind the scenes, do you think Olaf Meister, did he actually, inside, did he really think he was like, if not the best, then he, no one was going to beat him. He, he could play up to the same level as any other player. I mean, well, for, first off, I actually, to be honest, in my opinion, it is super close between between Flash and Olaf, who is the, the best player of this year. I mean, mo most people probably won't agree with me, but I, I think it's very, very close between them. But I think they are both uh, top two, 100%. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure Olaf sli goes slightly above, maybe, and gets the number one. But I think they are very, very close. Uh, I think they, those two were the best players this year, for sure. But, I mean, I actually don't think... I, I, Olaf isn't really a cocky guy. He, he is really, really humble. And I think the thing is, he's he always wants to win so much. So he's, he's of course, he's never going to say, like, an opponent is better than him, like, in his head. But, yeah, I mean, you, you can't really respect people. You saw when I used to fear Ken S, I got smashed all the time. So you, you need to think that you are the best in the head. But I think he, he, he is a really, really humble guy. So I don't think he's that cocky in his head, to be honest. Okay. So over this whole year, you won so many tournaments. Like, put it this way, if I was doing an interview with another player, okay, that if say I was doing an interview with a Navi player, like Navi won something like three tournaments over the whole year, so I'd, I would have to go into de de depth on every single tournament they won. I'd probably talk about all the big fans, but literally that would be like a waste of time for this interview because it lasts about four hours because you won like over ten tournaments, two majors, well, etc., etc., etc. When you look back, obviously you played a lot of tournaments, and there were some tournaments you didn't win, and sometimes you were disappointed. And you came in the semifinals or the final. Does it seem ridiculous how many tournaments, when you look back over the whole year, that you actually won? Like the number of times you were number one and you won the trophy? And yeah, I mean now now that you now when we're about to start packing again for this year, and you look back at the past year, I mean it feels it's hard to describe. Really, it's it's really insane how much we have won. But I think it's very hard to reflect over it uh, when you're still in the game. You know, I think. Uh, in a few years, maybe when we retired or some something like that, looking back, it's gonna be way, way, way sicker. But I mean, 
it's it's still pretty unreal uh, how much we won last year, but obviously we're going into 2016 to to break that record. If that is possible, I don't know, but we we, we always aim to to being the best, and uh, yeah, we're gonna do our best this year as well. So one of the things I thought was really interesting was in the summer period, you still won tons of tournaments. You had like those dream, it's like DreamHack, Gfinity, another DreamHack, ESL Pro League finals. So there's still all these tournaments you're winning. But I remember what I found strange was it felt like your team wasn't like the clear cut number one, though, because there were all these times where it would be close, like like Envious could win a map off you or... I mean, you already mentioned before, Titan actually beat one a series off you at the ESEA, and obviously in the ESL Pro League Finals, Fnatic was always close to beating you on all these maps. Was there something different about Fnatic when it got to the summer? Because I remember the Fnatic of 2014 was like, you'd win and you'd just stomp people, you know, you're like wrecking them completely. It felt like this one, you, you were more like, you had to just hang on, or you had to like win with like the veteran smarts or something. What, what was different about this year, do you think, in that sense? Uh, I think we we started to lack a bit of practice uh, after a few months into the the year I think uh, due to to different reasons and I think that also led to other other opponents uh, uh, becoming better and all that but always when the games got re really really tight and stuff like that it feels like we we somehow played 10 times better and managed to close the games uh, at least that's how it felt for us uh, or m from my perspective i don't know how it was to watch but i think the the most the biggest difference was that we we lacked some practice i would say uh, but we we still won because when it got really really tight we just played uh, played our hearts out or how you say you don't have to mention any details about it, but I've got to ask you this question. Sometime in 2015, JW could have left to another team, was going to leave to another team. It was, you know, it, it was this close to happening. It didn't happen. Is, is this true? I mean, you know, the rumors were out there. You were the player always people were mentioning. Could we have seen JW in a different jersey in 2015? Um... Mm. Maybe I shouldn't answer that, but only because I know Richard Lewis is a hardworking guy, and he okay. he he is uh, always publishing stuff, and he gets shit on it for. Uh, but he, to be honest, it's like ninety percent of the times so he's always right. So it's actually true, and it was. I don't know how how close it was, but it it was very very close. Uh, eventually, it did not happen. And uh, yeah, I'm. I guess I I'm happy for that because we. This was. Um, I think two or three weeks prior to the first major. Kind of Uh Yeah. Uh, okay. So, it was two or three weeks before the first major, and uh, as you said, it was very very close, but it did not happen, and uh, we went on to win the major and the upcoming major and plenty of more tournaments so so I'm, I'm i'm glad it it didn't happen i guess okay so i have to ask a follow-up to that obviously <laughs> yeah it's great that it didn't happen because i mean it's almost impossible you could have won as many tournaments anywhere else because you fnac won so many over the year it can you give us just any kind of reason as to why that would happen like why why because to anyone else they think like i say fans are going to think we're well, always going to win all these tournaments why would you ever consider leaving the best team you know that sort of thing so is there a reason as to why was there a main reason would you have been like the star player of another team was there was there anything like that involved in it i mean it was it was very much like i i don't know i i had like a down period i felt like i didn't really fit in in game wise maybe and then the offer came and it like made perfect sense for me to get a new challenge and all that and it was kind of maybe a shot that maybe I have been wanting to get since since I started with CSGO you know like so I think it was mostly like me wanting to try something new because I have been for playing for Fnatic and in, in a team that I actually created like three years ago or so uh, yeah, for three years, and I, I just thought it was it was time for something new. But yeah, that that's the most part. Like I, I didn't have any bad fee bad uh, 
uh, like it, it was no bad blood between me and my teammates or anything like that and they they also respected everything and they they actually showed me a lot of support and I think that was a gr- great great move by them and I am forever forever thankful for them for actually showing me that kind of respect in a situation like that so I think it was most mostly me having a maybe bad period uh, individually in, in life maybe like on a personal level confidence stuff and stuff like that and combined with trying to to find a new challenge okay so when we like i said i always have to set this context so even though you won all those tournaments in the summer when you came into the major esl one cologne actually if you remember a lot of people were like oh i don't know if Fnatic will win this one i mean if you remember at the time that's when a lot of people were like oh new envious lineup will win it for sure they are so hot right now you know i mean tsm was looking better they'd won tournaments and obviously at the time they were always beating you guys this was the one where it felt like a, this feels like if, if i was going to make a movie of any of your major wins this would be the one i'd make the movie of you know and the movie would show like like the first act would be like the Virtus pro match you know and then they'd be it'd be like rocky you know they'd be like beating the fuck out of you for most of the match but then suddenly something happens and you get this crazy comeback you come back you win the series and then obviously in the final it'd be a similar thing like the final boss is there it's new envious everyone's like they're they're gonna win this for sure and you do the great comeback there what what was going on at ESL one cologne because these two huge comeback games both happened where you had these timeouts and you had these timeouts you discuss something that obviously none of us know what you discussed and then suddenly you do these crazy comebacks if you were filling in the part of the movie that i haven't got there what what happens in these because obviously in the movie by the way it would be something like products would be like brothers <laughs> it's the darkest hour you know it'd be like some amazing speech but it can't have been that in real life what actually happened in these timeouts Okay, so during these timeouts, when uh, people actually think uh, Pronax is calling the most strategic thing ever, what actually happens is he calls a pause, he says, calm down guys, say nothing, just sit and chill, calm down. We say nothing for like maybe two or three minutes, and then he says like, okay, so what, what should we do now? And then we just come up with like so, something we want to do like rush all five there or go four here and go fast contact or whatever like that but the the biggest thing he actually said during these pauses was shut up guys sit sit and be chill chill down and then yeah just go go at it again i guess so it was never like any super tactic or anything like that it was mostly just chill out guys calm down because like for example, during that, uh, I remember during that uh, Dust Two game uh, versus Envias. Uh, actually, me and <laughs> me and Flash, I got uh, in a like not not really a fight, but we started to to yell a bit at each other in team speak and stuff like that. And uh, then we took the pause and like like what are we doing? Shut shut up and chill down and stuff like that. So it wasn't any sick tactic or something like that. Whenever I'm talking to people from other games and they look at Counter-Strike, a lot of them, especially if they've played like public server in CS 1.6, they might naively be like, oh, Counter-Strike, that's just about whoever's the best at headshotting the other guy. And I'm always like, no, 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 you've got to realize there's tactics here and like these maps, they practice specific ways and they study the demos. So I'm always bigging up the tactical side. But... When you describe it like that, that these ta- this is, I'd heard a similar thing as well from Pronox and Vogo. Like a lot of the thing of the time out was just like chilling out and kind of like mentally resetting like the, yeah. the the psychological factor. And then the idea, and then when I looked at the Fnatic team, it, it looked like a lot of the time you had the basic tactics in place that were obviously being called, but it feels like a lot of the team was like intuitive. Like people kind of just knew what to do when this other player does this. It. it at the top top level obviously there are tactics obviously there are just skills is there a degree to which part of being a top team is just like somehow you just there's an you naturally just somehow fit together or or from practicing somehow that guy just plays the right way it's like it's not you're not necessarily telling him what to do it's not necessarily like a super precise tactic is is there some component of this do you, do you when you i mean obviously Fnatic, you've said you've won tons of tournaments sometimes it's like this right you just you just play and somehow you win can you describe yeah, what it's like in that sense? I think like the ma- majority of the the matches we have won have never really been strategical. It's more like, let's say I get a feeling, uh, uh, and I just do that, and 
Pronax, Pronax is really, really good at doing stuff like that because I say like, let's say it's one second left of the freeze time. I just get a feeling I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push here with op, and it's like, okay, then he comes up super quick in his mind with like, okay, you go there, you go there, you go there, and so, so that we actually get the, get a good setup out of it, uh, out of my feeling. And then mid uh, mid round and stuff like that, it's players like all of his like, okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do this now. I'm gonna throw this smoke here and I'm gonna go up there, blah blah and stuff like that. So then he's like, okay, then we do this, blah blah. So it's like, it was mostly one p one player taking initiative and uh, Pronax built around that and also. Of course, all of us were were so so good. I would say so that whatever we decided to do, whatever we decided to take initiative to do, we we succeeded in doing it and got the kill and got the site and stuff like that. So, uh, but you all, also to be a top team, you also need those uh, set strats. You need to have some tactics in your book, and you need to you need to know a bit of your opponents and all that. Uh, we we are not really a team that have looked in too much to our opponents. Uh, it have been some lately. Uh, Flasha is is actually very very good at that to see his opponents uh, like what they do and stuff like that. Not not only through the walling game though, uh, but yeah, he he he's good at studying teams. I would say, which Pronax also was to be honest. But I I would say we we got a bit slackish with the old team. Uh, we we mostly played like went all in for the majors you know and then we got a bit chill on the rest once I, th- I think when it was during the i think it was roughly like april to about let me think maybe like april to like the end of the summer was the period of time where you kept playing tsm and they kept beating you when they were played you head-to-head what was difficult about playing TSM there? Because obviously the old TSM before they got Carrigan was the team that everyone used to love to play in the big semis or whatever because they, they always choked it up, you know. What was different about that TSM, do you think? The biggest difference was, uh, like, first of all, it felt like, kind of like I explained that when we get in a close game, we play 10 times better. It felt like whenever they get matched up against us, they play 100 times better. It's like... They did. It felt like they did everything perfect, and I mean, they they always played super super good at us. And when we tried to study them and like watch, what watch what they do against other teams, it's like they don't do that kind of stuff uh, as they do against us. I don't know if they, for, of course, Kerrigan studied us a lot. I know that he he knew like all we did on most most maps, but I think it was to begin with. Uh, like the first few matches, I remember like PGL and stuff like that. I think we, it was mostly like unlucky. They they just played better than us, of course. But then after a few games, we started to think too much about it, and we started to think like, ah, uh, they 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 know what we do. We need to do something else. And then we didn't even play like we like our own game. Uh, so I think the first few games they just played slightly slightly better than us, and then the rest of the games we just started to overthink. I would say. So in 2015, you won two majors. You won a major in 2013. So everyone else in history at that point in time had one major. Like the envious guys, some of them have two majors now. You and Flasher have three and Pronax is three. Do you, when, when you started out in CSGO, it was quite a while before you were ever in the best team in the world. It was like over a year, year and a half, whatever it might be. Do, do you feel as though, like, since you've won the most majors, is there some sort? Is this like your destiny? Were you always? Did you always somehow know you were going to be a champion? Is this something that is it going to continue? Are you going to end up with the most majors in history when it all finishes? What do you think? I mean, the goal is to, of course, go down as a legend within the game, I guess, and uh, being the most achieved would be an honor, of course, and I think. What I did right was that I started out by making my own team, and yeah, we, we stick together. But we we saw pretty fast like who didn't didn't fit, you know. I, I, like pretty fast, you knew like for example when it goes way way back, we had one guy he didn't want to practice as much, so we had to cut him. Uh, another time, one guy he like showed up late, and you know he he pretty much. Uh, 
shits on us, you know, when when we are dedicated and really really want to do this. So we had to get rid of him. And I mean, I think I think the biggest uh, reason for why I'm here because I I to I, I know when to take the take the decisions. For example, when yeah, when stuff needs to happen, <clears throat> which is something maybe maybe NIP did wrong. They I would say they sticked together for too long, so they missed like too many opportunities. And then, I mean, I, I respect that as well, of course, trying to re- really trying everything. But sometimes you need to understand that you have to let the friend go. And uh, I think that that is a big reason to why <clears throat> why I've come so far. Uh, I think because I I know when it's time to do the right decisions. I guess. Okay, so that that question leads me perfectly into into this topic, which is when you made this new Fnatic lineup, because Pronax left the team. Dennis, well, obviously, had played in LGB with Olaf and with Crims, comes into the lineup. But one of the interesting things about this move is there had actually been rumors for a number of months. As soon as Fnatic had even started, like even around the summer. Like, maybe Fnatic will, who knows, maybe some of them will retire, maybe they'll just break up, maybe they'll change players. And part of the reason people kept saying these things was that they said, oh, behind the scenes, you know, things don't always go well. Like, like when they win, okay, things are fine and they can keep going, right, well, we're winning, so obviously we'll stick together. But it always felt like, and I always kind of suspected this as well, as soon as things go badly enough, like you just know you're not winning, like you've lost three or four in a row, and obviously at this point in time you actually lost a major as well, that eventually someone's going to at least quit or someone's going to be kicked or someone's going to get replaced, whatever order it's going to be in. Now, one of the things that people have suggested since then was that in some way people like didn't think Pronox's style of leadership was the best anymore or something or they wanted to try a different style of leadership. Can you tell us anything along those lines? Like what, like what was going on behind the scenes? Like, I mean, put it this way, as like an initial start to the question. Fnatic wasn't always best friends at all points in time through all of 2015, even though you're winning all these tournaments, right? There were always like different groups of people within the team and something like this, right? Yeah, I mean, f- first of all, I actually, I think I commented this before uh, somewhere, but it's actually bullshit that it was like discussed for a long time. I, I remember, I think it was Sadokis or someone who said that we have been discussing this for so long and he have seen that blah, blah, so so much stuff behind the scenes. Okay. But it, it is actually bullshit. Uh, after Klush Napoka was, I think, the first time that it came up. Uh, and uh, I know there was a rumor also that we actually talked to Dennis at Klush Napoka, but that is also not true. Um, so I, th- I think the, o- the only thing is like discussions like this we're in the team was when uh, when I was supposed to leave for, for, for another team and I think at that point man it felt like they maybe wanted to do, to try new things and stuff like that but I think that's basically the only only time we, we never never really talked about yeah roster changers before uh, before we actually did it, so after Clash Napoca, that is, and uh, yeah, the the back the back scene stuff like we we don't really we never really argue that much to be honest. Me, it's mostly I heard like also from Sadokist and not uh, they think that it was like a bad <laughs> okay. bad uh, what is it called uh, bad marriage. No, bad bad. Uh, stuff in the team i don't know how to explain it team atmosphere yeah exactly because for example me and crims booked plane tickets home when we lost and stuff like that but that's only because we we want to be at home because we travel so much and we are away from home so much we if we go out one day earlier than expected then we go home that day because we can get one extra day at home and uh, not all of us uh, uh, not everyone in the team uh, have the same thinking about that so not everyone is going home of course but that, that, there's no like bad blood or anything like that okay so okay well, well all we've actually learned from that is that Sadik is full of shit just completely yeah, yeah. full of shit okay so yeah, we've learned that, that. that that's where I want to come from <laughs> okay so 
so what so could, so then explain to me the the thing with Pronax leaving then because obviously I mean you kind of referenced already in this interview he he was an important part of Fnatic I mean he set in yeah. place what's funny is you have to go back even beyond the Crimson lineup to see his impact because obviously when he came into the Fnatic initially was when things really turned around and you actually turned from being just fraggers into a team that was in a real team you know I knew how to play the game and had good maps and became a top team was there any okay how much of it was like a mutual thing? Like, like you guys were like, oh, we're thinking of maybe going a different direction. He was like, okay, fine. You know, I'll go do something else. That's fine. W w w was there anything along these lines? Um, I think everything started at, uh, I remember it was World Championship or something. Pronax went there with Devil Walk, Exist, Pauf, and I think maybe Pith. Pith. Yeah, yeah, Pith. By the way, think, do you say Pith or is it Pith or Pith? Or I have what? no idea. In Sweden, it's Pith. Ah, okay. I don't know. Just wondering. But but yeah, at that event, I think he he got back. He he got to felt how it is to actually play with friends again, you know, because they they mostly went as uh, a friendly team. Uh, so I think uh, after that event, I think he started to think about uh, a lot about it, and he. I uh, I think we noticed a lot on him after that event that he maybe wasn't as motivated and stuff like that, and. Then after Krishna Poker, when we sat down talking about it, I mean, he told us that he 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 don't want to to resign for 2016, and I mean, we said like, yeah, okay, fine, uh, I guess, but then we want to make the change now, because as it looked like we had a lot of problems in game, and uh, to to fix those problems is gonna take like a lot of time and uh, dedication and hard work, but why should we put that? dedication and hard work down when he's not going to play with us the next two months or yeah after two months uh, or so so it was like it was like a mutual agreement i mean we we noticed on him that his motivation dropped off and i pretty sure it was because of that uh, world championship tournament where, where he he got to remember how it is to play just with friends you know uh, stuff like that so i think that is why why he decided to do it and i'm pretty sure he he wanna like build a team with unproven players or or with kind of friends ish and see where it takes him i think towards the end when he was in fanatic was his style at least for that fanatic lineup was it not as good was it not as effective like did people in the team want to do different things i think like in his defense i think we I think he started to call worse because we started to not uh, like trust him 100% in his calls anymore. So I think he he started to to uh, yeah, I think he started to call worse simply because we we started more and more to do our own thing because we thought maybe that was 100% the key to our success. Uh, so we went away pretty much from callings I would say we didn't we didn't do that much calling by then I think and uh, that's that's from my perspective at least um, so I think in his defense I think we made it a lot a lot a lot harder for him to call by the end to be honest in 2015 did JW have a slump I mean in my opinion I, I like after watching some uh, some tweets and stuff like this, like Lurpis, for example, uh, in my opinion, I have I have been very very disappointed with my with my individual level this year. But at the same time, we have won so much, so people might question me for even thinking that. But at the same time, I feel like if I played at my at, uh, as I should, if I played good, I, we maybe would have won the championships easier, and if maybe not even lost the games we actually have lost. So I don't know. I I think I, have, in my opinion, I've played very mediocre this year, but some stats ish maybe say I didn't. But I would say I, I'm I'm very disappointed in my in my overall uh, individual level this whole year. If that answers your question, <laughs> sure. When the year was finished and you saw how many championships you won, you'd won both two out of the three majors, 
I think if it was super super close, I think it would be the like the the political thing to do if you wanted all the fans to like you would be to say, well, we had a very good year, but you know what? No one will ever match NIP. They were eighty seven zero. They won all those tournaments. You know, they're obviously still the greatest. Like that's like a way to like the fans would love that. They'd lap it up. You know, I think it's brilliant. But I noticed some of your players did say like, no, I think we're the best team of all time now. You know, we've won the majors, we've won all these tournaments. Do you think? This fanatic team, the, well, the previous one, not the one with Dennis, obviously. Do you think the previous fanatic? Do you think? Do you think that should go down as the best CS:GO team in history? Yeah, I think so because, first of all, uh, uh, I mean, not to take anything away from NIP, of course, but what we did was under a much, much more competitive era. Uh, era. Uh, because I mean, when they did their six-six streak, which is very sick, but. To, teams started to get into the game, you know, and when when we did what we did, everyone were playing full time. Like every every top team at most events played full time, which maybe teams didn't do back then and stuff like that. So I th- I think we take uh, the number one and they are number two, in, in my opinion. Okay, when you look back on this year, and like I said, the number of tournaments won was was amazing. I mean, it, obviously, I mean, okay, if we, if we just talk about the, the other lineup, okay, the one before this Dennis lineup now. So I think, if I remember rightly, the number of actual lands was like nine, but that does count like Clutch Corn and it counts like the Fragmite Champions yeah. Showdown, which some people maybe they don't count. So, but even so, it's still a lot of lands. Now, when people look back on Nip going 8-7-0, they look back on all the tournaments that first lineup with Fifth Lauren won. They won like, I don't know, like 20 tournaments or something. It's easy to look back on that and go, well, no one will ever match that. No one can ever do that again, etc., etc. I know going into this year with the Dennis lineup, you've already won three tournaments at the end of last year. You're the number one team now. People expect you to win more next year and there will be a lot of tournaments still. Even so, if you just won like eight tournaments next year, it's going to be a pretty fucking amazing year. Do you think it's really ever possible to repeat what happened this year? I definitely, definitely think it is possible. Um, I mean, I think if uh, if if we play like we can, if I know we can, like for for example myself, if I play like to my potential, and uh, everyone keeps doing as good as they are, I, it's definitely possible. I would say. Uh, I think what many analysts and everyone is like, everyone is kind of doubting her lineup, maybe because. Yeah, like people say, we we won three tournaments, but it was very close and blah blah. But in my opinion, it's like we we practiced maybe one maximum two weeks with Dennis, and uh, the the more the more time we get together, the more uh, tactics we're gonna get implemented in the game, and the more strategical we're gonna be. So I mean, as the more we play with each other, the better we're gonna be, and I'm one hundred percent percent sure about that. So. Uh, I definitely think it is possible, but maybe someone else does it and not to be like Envias, for example, or some other team might do it instead. Okay. Right. When you keep saying that, like if I play to my level, like, you know, if I play the way I could and when I know I could, if you played to your max capability, would JW be the best player in the world? <laughs> That's very hard actually because I think when I play to my max maximum uh, level, I think I help other to be able to be the best players in the world. If you get me, okay. Like I I open up sites, I open up like the middle on inferno and stuff like that, so the others can go up and take the rest. But I mean, so, somewhere I need to trust myself as well. So I I, I think. If I play to like my best level, I think I could be the best player in the world. Okay, do you remember a famous clip that's been in a lot of actual movies and highlights? I, th- I forget who you were against in the specific game, but it was on Dust 2, and it's where you ran along, you got boosted up to Catwalk, you ran along Catwalk, you jumped out of Catwalk, you landed on the Xbox, and you shot someone in the head with an AWP who was at the T-Spawn <laughs> sniper's part as T on Dust 2. Which, obviously, when you watch that clip, people are just like, 
that's retarded. That doesn't make any sense. Why would someone do that? Like, there was like another famous clip, the one where you were against TSM on Dust 2, where they Cajun B threw that Molotov in and you ran and you jumped over the Molotov, jumped right behind him and you shot him in his back and then he went back. And then everyone again was like, how's anyone supposed to know how it was going to happen? Like, you, you put, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I think most people, when they watch those clips, they don't think anything's going on in your brain, right? They think inside your brain, it's like a fucking disco party, like <laughs> just like crazy, and you just do whatever you want, and you just do random stuff. Okay, that's what I know. It's what some opponents think, mate. They think like you just do random. You know, in fact, that's why I think uh, opponents always like hate on you because they think you just do random shit that doesn't make sense. But obviously there's a style there because I've seen you play this style a lot and it's not like you do it every round and it's not like you do it all the time against the same opponent and you do manage to in a lot of these examples I'm giving it worked like this crazy approach did work is there like a logic to it do you do you, do you yourself know your style really well defined do you like it, if you had to like write it all down if your career was over could you explain how you play I I actually think so in 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 one way yeah I mean the thing is, like for example, the Molotov thing. Uh, I know how how much damage it's gonna take. Blah blah. So, and I get the gut feeling. So, it's. I mean, I think it's uh, all, uh, some some stuff are very calculated, and some some are very very random as well, of course. But I think uh, it, it is one kind of a playstyle I, I would say and I think I think I could write, write something down if I if I had to actually but I think it should be my secret for now is there anyone in the okay here, here's a good question for you so like I described there, I kind of hinted that to other players you're the most annoying player because if you do something like that they're going to be like what's well, fucking idiotic like what was I supposed to do how am I supposed to know he's going to do that is there a player that's like that for you where it's just really fucking annoying and just does weird shit that you don't just surprises you or just always does the annoying kill on you is in the wrong spot is there someone who's ever been like that in your career that's a tough one actually I, I don't really think so actually maybe actually maybe maybe happy like but that is like in the other way instead because it's like it's so obvious he's gonna be there and I know he's gonna be there and it's so retarded if he is there but he is there and he still kills me like I think it's kind of the same way but totally different you know it's like reverse He's just predictable, but you can't stop him. Yeah, kind of ish. Like you, you know, you know what he what what he's gonna do, and you know that he shouldn't do it because it's stupid if he does it because you you know he's gonna do it and he still does it. Like, so I, I think I have to say happy on that one. Okay. When you uh, think of yourself as a player now. There was a time, especially at the end of 2014, where you used the AWP all the time. And what's funny is I actually used to say to people, especially like newer pl newer people who are watching the game, like it might sound weird, but I didn't. I never think of JW as like an AWP, like an AWPer, like an AWP only player who's always going to have the. You know, he's not like Guardian and Kenny S where they should have the AWP every single round. You know, I always said it's more like at that point in time you would you were just super hot with the AWPs. It was like it made sense to use it, but throughout your whole career. You've actually always been a player who's used all the guns, and especially this year, you were using like lots of weird guns. You were using shotguns all the time, so you 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 had like a full variety of using weapons. Do you think of yourself as an opera? Do you do you put yourself in that category? Why why do you? Okay, here's a weird question. Why do you use those weird guns like shotguns so much? When in theory, most of the time, like an AK is pretty similar price, and an AK is supposed to be a much better gun, right? Most of the really good players just use an AK. Yeah, well, I think uh, mo like every gun in the game is good for different situations, and I I try to like find out uh, in what situations one gun is the best. You know, like for example, drop as terrorist. Sort of, so, sort of, the shotgun is like one of the best guns ever in that situation. But I don't think people really really figure that out until uh, until maybe I started to do it and also of course I'm I'm good with the gun as well so that helps it but I mean I, I wouldn't consider myself as an opera uh, no, at least not these days I would I would definitely do it before uh, but I mean now I'm not I, I'm, I'm probably not even the main opera in the team anymore so I wouldn't call myself an, an opera uh, these days but yeah, I, I, I just try to find guns 
because let's let's be real in, in global offensive every gun is retardedly good pretty much so i just try to find out in in what situations and stuff like that the gun a certain gun is the best for pretty much so I remember earlier in 2015, I actually was talking to you about the situation we described before where you could have left and gone to this other team and, you know, maybe you wouldn't have won so many tournaments. And I actually tried to give you some advice, right? I told you, like, like you've got to realize, you know, you can't take for granted how many, fi- you know, you've been in so many finals, you've won so many titles. It probably feels easy to you, you know. I said, to, I, in fact, the example I gave you was just look at someone like Device. I mean, we know he's a really good player, but look how long in his career he had to go before he even made a final. And then even when he made finals, it's always been really hard work for them to win the titles that they've won or you look at other teams versus pro wins titles but you know it's not easy it has to be they have to be in peak mode so i tried to make this point to you because i was trying to make the point that like you know always like keep hold of like a winning lineup like never make any risky changes but then you guys changed players you got dennis and then you just won the first three tournaments in a row so i guess i was wrong right it's, it's easy to win you just win in tournaments all the time like you wake up one day you win a tournament next tournament, i guess win that one as well must must just be easy right it's pretty easy to win tournaments uh like l- lately actually it's it's pretty retarded but it's it feels like you, you always have this feeling going into a tournament uh that you're gonna win it i don't know it's it's very it's very weird but some uh some tournaments you just go in and you know you're gonna win them uh i mean it's it's never easy today because uh like the competition is so so hard and every every team is catching up day by day i would say everyone is getting so much better and now that uh, uh this face it pro league the fpl thing is also like doing a lot for like everyone is de- developing a lot more but also every pro player is showing their individual moves to every other top player almost you know so people start to know a lot bo- more about each other and stuff like that so it's it's very very hard and it's only getting harder i would say since you said like the this lineup with dennis he'd only practiced a few weeks and obviously these tournaments were like all in a row basically like there was only a few days it was like a week between each i think it was like a three week span or something do you have has the actual style of the lineup with dennis and with flusher as the in game has it set yet do you, is, it, is it still is it still like up in the air? You, is some of this being free for all style? I think it's still up in the air. Like we haven't even really discussed yet what uh, like some maps where where to hold them, blah blah. Like we, we haven't really gone through everything yet. So now when we're starting at the new year and we know that we have much more time than we actually had before those three tournaments, we're gonna we're gonna figure everything out. So yeah. So, okay, I've got a little, a, a quick fire thing to end the interview with this. It's going to be a good one, okay? So, what I wanted to do was, since over the whole year we had all those tournaments and we all, and everyone got to play every opponent almost and every map, especially since you went so deep in all the tournaments, I just want to see purely from your perspective how you saw the other teams. So, what we're going to do is, I'm going to go through the maps and I want to know for the year who you thought the best team on this map was. So obviously on some of them, you're probably going to say Fnatic. But I'm sure for some of them, there must be another team that like, maybe just for you specifically, stood out on that map that I might have thought someone different, you know, but in the games you played against them. So who do you think in 2015 the best Dust 2 team was? Hmm. I think Na'Vi. Na'Vi? Yeah. What were they so good at on it? They, they were always like, in my opinion, when, from when we played them, they were always the the best on it because they, I don't know, Gar- Guardian is insanely good on that map, and he kind of carries them a lot. <laughs> sure. Okay. What about Inferno? Fnatic. Fnatic. Because oh, we why? mostly because we have that uh, all of and creams do on Banana. I would say that makes it a lot easier for us. <laughs> Yeah, true. It's a classic fanatic map there. What about Mirage? Oof, that's actually a hard one. That's a very, very hard one. I think I think Virtus Pro. Because I don't know, they they have always been very, very sick in that map and they know 
they, they have very like fast rounds that you can't really stop even though you know they are coming you know the plow so I think we're just prone that one okay how about cash mm. can I say the new new NVS lineup yeah yeah if you want. yeah then I think the new NVS lineup because I don't know it feels like they have figured the whole map out like correctly it feels like yeah when we played them at clush uh, we got like 16 two or something like that like we, we couldn't do anything uh, they were insanely strong everywhere let me see what have we got left uh, train so obviously one of the newer maps only came in around like I think it was around like April May or something came in uh, in June I think That's a very, very hard one. I mean, Virtus Pro is very, very good on it, but I don't, I'm not sure if they are the best. That's a tough one. But I think I have to give advantage to Virtus Pro again, uh, because they, I think they figured out, I, I think they put down a lot more time on the map than every other team did and took it to their advantage, I think, uh, for most part of the year, that is. I think Virtus Pro, yeah. What about Cobblestone? Fnatic. Because, I don't know, I think, I think uh, especially in the beginning, like uh, everyone started after a while to, to steal everything we did because what we did was so strong on the map and it was the best uh, best way to play the map at that time, I think. So since everyone started to copycat us, I guess, I guess I have to say Fnatic on that one. Because the last one's going to be overpass. Yeah, that's. I want to say TSM or XTSM, but I'm not sure if I'm missing someone. Then. I mean, from what I remember, overpass was like TSM. You're right. There's Virtus Pro, there's Navi. Yeah, yeah. I I think XTSM actually. They, I know the the pre, for example, he's uh, probably the best player in playing like the toilets area. Uh, he's always uh, playing solo there, but he always gets like <coughs> two or three kills and stuff like that. So I think XT is on that one. So one of the interesting things about Fnatic, and this is something I always would stress as the year went on and you kept winning more tournaments, is I was always say, it's easy, like if this was a movie, it would be like, okay, you get on top and then you're just the best and that's why you win all the tournaments. But I said, actually, if you look at how many tournaments there was over the year and the times where you would drop off for a tournament, but then you'd come back for the next one, it wasn't like you just played the exact same style, you got on the exact same maps and you beat the exact same opponents. It's like the year went on and I, I said it's more like you have to look at it as though this wasn't one streak. It was like a bunch of little streaks. And so in between, you're having to like adapt to this opponent or you're having to pick up a new map. For example, at one point in time, Cobblestone became like one of the major strengths for your team, whereas before that, it was one of the teams you didn't play, maps you didn't play as much. Likewise, later on, later in the year, you actually started picking up Dust 2 a lot more. That used to be a map that used to be kind of more outside. So it felt to me like you had to like actually like battle to stay on top and like evolve to keep coming back to the top again. Was was did 2015 feel like a long time in that sense? Uh, I mean, actually, like looking back, it feels like 2015 just just flew away. <laughs> it went, it feels like it went very very fast to be honest. But I think uh, I, I kind of agree with you that uh, it's more of smaller streaks because we had to change up a lot all the time because when we, we, when we were when we were on top for so long like everyone watched us everyone tried to see what we do right do what we do good and all this and they tried to either counter it or they tried to steal it and maybe make it better and all like stuff like that so for example cobblestone in the end we couldn't we could barely play it because everyone either had everything we did and they also used it as a counter and stuff like that so I, I kind of agree with you that that it's more of a smaller streak because we had to we had to change a lot on the way to to stay on top was there ever a moment in the year where there was again obviously i love movies so i, I want to believe life's like a movie jw was there ever like a really cool moment where like 
Pronax or someone figured out something key, like okay, against this one team, we have to just do this, and this is how we'll beat them. Or mm-hmm. here's like the, the the map and the way to play against this one. But was there ever like a cool moment, in fact, like a eureka moment where you figured something out over the year? Ooh, that's a hard one. That's a very very hard one, actually. I think it's too hard to re- remember like one specific moment with that uh, all I can like that that goes way way back though but I remember uh, I think this must have been 2014 uh, this uh, face it in Milan I think it was yes season two uh, yeah we played uh, I think they were named Dignitas back then with Fetish yep uh, Pronax came up with a strat that when they smoke B on Inferno uh, we just uh, sneak up with four he grenades throw with CT spawn and uh, we killed Fetish and just took the bomb site. Uh, that that that's the only thing I can remember. Like, but that wasn't in 2015, though. Okay, fair enough. So, okay, <clears throat> let me ask you a question that will sound weird to anyone who started watching in the last <laughs> six months. So, anyone who just only watched 2015 will be like, "Wow, for like one, like all these tournaments, they won like two of the majors. You know, they uh, broke the prize money record. Whatever, all the stats, you know." But I always tell people that, like, kind of like I said in the interview, you know, sometimes you were winning, like, you were just clinging on, or you were doing comebacks, or you had to figure out how to beat an opponent. But when I remember when you first started winning all those tournaments in 2014, that was where it was like no one could touch you. It was like you were going to win all these tournaments. Even I mean, LDLC was the second best team, and he was beating them every time. Obviously, this will sound weird, but was Fnatic 2015 as good as Fnatic 2014? Just in terms of the peak, um, I think I think that 2014 was better, mostly because of like I don't know. That's a hard one because 2015, you know, we had Tech Nine. 2014, we had C Set. So it's it's like really hard. But I think I think it's it's those like retarded guns that uh, that differs the 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 level i think uh, because i think individually we we have been super super good both years but for example 2014 as i said the c set and 2015 we had tech nine so i think it i think it's just those two two guns that uh, differs mostly so it's really hard to say so fanatic still is winning tournaments now and you've already you have the most majors in history if I, if you really did, if say CS:GO ends in three years, okay, if you really could finish CS:GO and you'd won more majors in your whole career than like Forrest and Get Right and you know all these legendary players that we all think of as like the Mount Rushmore of Counter Strike, if if that could really happen, like, what 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 would your thoughts on that be? If JW could really be remote, you know, it was J- like the Mount Rushmore. We have to like chisel away a couple of people, and JW's there, Flush is there. I mean. Well, uh, I didn't really understand that question. <laughs> is it possible? Does it does it seem ridiculous? Um, I actually don't think it seemed ridiculous. Uh, for example, yeah, no, no, I don't think it is ridiculous. To be honest, I think it's definitely possible, and I think uh, we have shown that this year. Are you someone who do you now put it this way? Once upon a time, people were like, JW, yeah, he's sick online. He's always got good highlight clips. You know what? He's not a big game player. He doesn't do that well on LAN. But then obviously now you've won a billion tournaments. Is that, if you think of yourself now, do you think like I'm a champion? I'm one of the best players. Like I'm, I'm always going to succeed. I'm a winner. I don't really uh, like, I think it's all have gone so fast. I don't really think of myself in that way. I, I still feel like that guy in my basement playing computer games you know it's like yeah i don't think i never really thought about it in that way i think it's gonna be be like that maybe when i retire and i look look back at my life and what i've achieved but right now i'm my goal is just to keep winning and all that so i don't really think think like that if you've won all these majors and you've won all these tournaments 
this sort I mean, I'm asking this question because it's unfortunately my job as an interviewer is sometimes you have to ask a question that makes you sound stupid so the person has a chance to answer. So are you ready for the stupid question? Because okay. I, I know this is a ridiculous question, but this is what people want to know, okay? So JW, you won all the majors, you've won all the tournaments and all the Mahrez money. What is there left to accomplish? Oof. Win all the majors in one year. Okay. <laughs> that's it. That's it? Uh, that's it, I think. Okay, do you have a final message for everyone who watched the interview? Oof. Uh, yeah, visit Alpha Draft, win some six Grilla. Exactly. Nah, nah but yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview and I hope you enjoy watching our team and I hope you keep watching us in 2016. Thanks, Amicit. Thanks, Amicit. <laughs>